Hey everyone, welcome to the team house. I am Jack Murphy. I am here with our guest tonight, Joe Goldberg. Joe is, uh, I know how crazy it sounds, but Joe was a CIA propagandist. He was a disinformation expert. Um, and we're gonna get into all of that with him. Um, but first off, I know a lot of you are wondering, you're like, hey Jack, where is Dave, uh, my co-host? Dave, um, you know, some of you already know because I, I mentioned it on uh, Twitter and I sent out a message to some of the supporters of the show um, to let you guys know. But for the rest of you who haven't heard yet, Dave got attacked uh, on the subway. This was uh, Wednesday night, about like 1030 at night. Dave takes the subway from where he and I live uh, in Brooklyn to Manhattan, uh, the L train. And he got attacked. Uh, somebody came up behind him and hit him in the head with a rock as he was sitting there on the subway reading. And he went unconscious for a couple moments, woke up, and this guy was still on top of him, slamming him in the back of the head with a rock. And, uh, you know, Dave, uh, tough guy, doesn't take any guff. He uh, managed, <laughs> even after getting knocked out, to get back up and tackle this guy and bring him down to the ground. And uh, at the next subway stop, this, the, his attacker ran off and disappeared. Uh, Dave got up and uh, somehow he managed to stumble his way to the police department and, um, and let them know that he'd been attacked and the police got him to, uh, to the hospital. And uh, once he was there, they, uh, the doctors looked at him. And they said his skull is fractured in several places. His uh, orbital bone is busted up. He's deaf in one ear and he had TBI, traumatic brain injury. Um, they downgraded the TBI from like, uh, like if it was level one, they downgraded it to, you know, two or from two to one, whatever it was. His injuries are not life-threatening. Um, I talked to him on the phone yesterday. Uh, he sounds like Dave, um, good old Dave, sounds like the same guy. So I'm hopeful that he's going to make a full recovery. Um, I had some texts with him today. He's, he's on bed rest, basically, in the hospital. The doctors are trying to figure out what's going to need surgery and what's just going to heal on its own. Um, but they're already talking about discharging him. So I'm going to go down to the uh, hospital tomorrow to try to see him, um, provided they're accepting visitors. And uh, because Dave uses uh, Veterans Affairs VA for his healthcare services, uh, he's going to have some pretty extensive medical bills to pay for. So uh, I went ahead and I started up like a GoFundMe campaign for Dave today. Um, and you can find the link down in the description of this video um, if you're interested in donating to help Dave's recovery. Uh, and that has nothing to do with this podcast or the show or any of that kind of stuff. It's That's for Dave to pay his medical bills, his rehabilitation. That's what it's for. Um, and you guys, just in like a matter of a few hours, you've already raised like close to $6,000. So I'm overwhelmed by your generosity. It means a lot to me, uh, but it means the world to Dave. Uh, it, it, it means everything to him. And he just wanted me to let you guys know that this is what had happened to him. He wants to be here. Uh, if you're trying to get in touch with him, he's not blowing you off. He's just in a hospital bed and he's got you know, some things. He's got some bigger things on his plate right now. So that's the, that's the deal with Dave, and uh, I'll keep you guys updated and let you know how things are going with him, um, but he'll, he'll be back as soon as he can, and, you know, he's, you know, I, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around all of this, probably Dave is too, um, but NYPD is actively looking for this guy, and uh, as far as, once I have more information, I'll, I'll share it with you guys, but that's kind of all I got right now. So, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, kind of doing the show solo, but we have a great guest, uh, Joe. Uh, I, I've talked to a few times in the past and we were just having a good conversation before we started up the show. Um, Joe, I wanna start off uh, kind of the way we start with all, most of our guests is I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your upbringing, where you came out of and how exactly does one become a CIA propagandist? Like how, how do you get that job that you find an ad in the personnel section in the newspaper, how does that work? Before I start, I just think it's horrible, the story about Dave, and, I, and I'm sure all the subscribers and people who follow you are giving him all the support they can. I'm definitely going to hit the GoFundMe page when this is all done to, uh, to help him out. That's just, that's a whole uh, story. Um, How did I start? I was actually at the University of Iowa. Uh, I had a political science degree and a communication, master's degree in communication, theater arts, division of broadcasting and film, and a minor degree in history. And 
I wanted to go to law school, kind of waiting around for my lousy LSAT scores to come up. Got accepted to a few schools, but I had still a chance to use the University of Iowa career placement place and CAA came on campus to interview. This would have been 1985, <coughs> excuse me. And so I put my name at the top of the list. I was trying to figure out a way to put my politics degree and my communications uh, desire to get a creative thing together. I thought, this is cool. And I kind of always wanted to be in a, sort of a public service job there at the beginning. And so they came on campus. It was the middle of a uh, Ron Contra, the war in Nicaragua. And so when they heard that the uh, CAA guy was coming on campus to interview, there were people all over the um, uh, union, the University of Iowa Union, where the interviews were in camouflage and they had the signs and they had the mannequin bodies oh, and they were wow. dragging around the bloody things. And uh, I, I kind of followed them in by a little distance and he went up to, they were following him and they were chanting. He just walked up the stairs. They had to kind of, they actually weren't just dragging mannequins. They were actually kind of dragging real people. And the guy had to stop, of course, he didn't want to drag his friend up the stairs. Uh, and so then after that, that came in, he was, a, he was a great sense of humor from the point of view of that's this part of the territory. I went in an interview with him and it took a while. They actually kind of lost my app, but uh, nine months to a year later, I got the phone call saying, come on, come to DC and meet some people. I met a few different offices and I got brought into the director of intelligence. Uh, all the names are different now, but it was global. It was graphic services branch turned into the visual media branch. And I was the uh, media analyst. I had a t degree in television, broadcasting, and communications, and TV was becoming an action intelligence tool. You're in, in, inside a building that is full of people who went to Yale and Harvard and they write papers and they read, they read reports and cables that come from overseas. And I'm like, you know what? You can watch a news story about what's happening in South Africa and get real-time intelligence with this thing called Tenement Square. You know, that's happening on TV type of thing. Oh, that was a little bit later, but well, about my about, about that time. But these things are happening and, you know. I, to, to take us back for a moment, because yeah. goodness, goodness gracious, there are probably millennials watching this who have no idea what the media environment was like back in, in the in the 1980s when you came on the job. I mean, you were still in that analog era, although live television was coming around. I mean, could you just describe what the media environment looked like at that at that moment? Yeah, we were in the, every we were transitioning. Uh, CNN had been on the air for about five, six years. MTV been on the air for about five, six years. Uh, it was we were going, we were, we were the, the VHS beta wars were just being decided the, 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 uh, in, in the Supreme Court. This I watched some stories about these things called CDs and DVDs and digital technologies. <laughs> how crazy that's going to wipe out this whole vinyl record industry and that's how bad it's going to be. And that's where we were. We were at this movement and that's kind of where my expertise or thought process came in was how do you go from here to there? Because it was it was new. It was, it was, how do you, how do you, because I wouldn't expect people who have read documents for the books and sit around, sat around in meetings and long tables and paneled offices to get messages across. And, so, and someone's taking down the minutes of the meeting. Taking down the minutes and there's all these pictures of old white, black and white, white guys on the wall. And you're saying, you know, I can show you this real time. And actually, I picked up, I had a project that I actually saw, I think it's still in there like in the museum museum that I, I call it the video they, you know there's the pit there's a pdf we all know the, the, the presidential daily and i created the vid the video daily which was pulling down major sources stories and popping them through it was then a fledgling closed circuit tv inside the agency but because here's what you need to be learning about and you know ronald reagan was a video guy right his predecessor wasn't so how do you use that stuff to influence or help out the decision makers make informed decisions about the country so you know, there's black and white printers at my desk and big old beast, you know, cathode ray tube televisions that one of us was always sort of watching, me and my partner, because things were happening, breaking news, real breaking news. You know, Tenement Square, I remember when I was doing, um, I was actually in the China Ops class during Tenement and the guys would come in every morning and they were like all, they'd been up all night and we were saying, what's new, what's new? And they said, CNN is getting better reporting than we are because CNN was broadcasting live on, on satellite phones from Tenement Square where agency people 
would have to go meet their sources or right. absorb, right. go back to the embassy, type by type, up it would go, blah, blah, blah. And that takes time where you can watch it. This, this was new. You could actually watch a, a revolution live on television and get the intelligence live at that time. And that was, that's, that's as revolutionary as Star Wars was at, in, for movie making. It was, oh my gosh, we can actually see these things. In fact, just digressing, there's a thing called the CNN effect at the time where it was bad being, CNN was the eyeball, old CNN was the eyeball of the world. And you wouldn't want to be shown have, to be a bad person because it's going to be beamed around the world and they're going to show how, how lousy you are. Well, that flipped, of course, when people realized, hey, you know what, I can use that. Here's my revolution. Come talk to me. I want to be seen around the world. <laughs> right, right. But there actually was a limiting effect by satellite television back then to say, we don't want to appear there because that's that's bad. That's bad PR. Then they figured out, no, oh, it's good PR. I can use it. So the smallest little dictator could get live coverage by doing something. So that so, was, we were in this crazy time at that time. And what, what was it like when, I mean, you got the job... It, do you, do you receive training on how to be a CIA propaganda well, yeah, officer? Yeah, the propaganda thing. So at that time I came in, I was a media analyst. I mean, I was, mm -hmm. I, if the, I mean, the things were happening, this was uh, Qaddafi, this was narco-terrorists, this was uh, hostages in Beirut, things well beyond most of your listeners, you know, it's like, for them that's, Stone eyes and bare skin. What, what what was the title of your job? Because I do I keep using that title propagandist because I think it's funny. But well, I had this crazy career, so I went into the DI overt to be a media analyst, and that's what I did. But I had this sort of or had I mean older um, crazy abilities to see things, memorize things, <clears throat> uh, supply, just know things. And the operations guys that come over who are doing things saying, "Hey, we need this." So I'm like, oh, I know where that is. I can get that. And you no, know, you should try to do this. And, and they were like, you, they, I, I think they were impressed because what they did is during a hiring freeze a year, exactly a year later than my onboard date, I got moved over to operations into the propaganda psychological group as the, within the TV branch. Was it called TV branch? I mean, I guess it was called TV branch. But I had a degree. I, wasn't, I didn't run the group. There were other, other people who were senior, but I had sort of had the TV degree. And we had experts, of course, who did did the actual production elements of it, but I was sort of like a producer and idea person and wrote some stuff. And that's when I went into propaganda operations. That's when it was wild, wild west, let's figure some stuff out. Let's let's cause these people pain as much as I possibly can. But I was a propaganda operations, I was a propaganda officer, PO, um, within television. So I went from okay, DI- so that, that was the title of the job. I was a propaganda operations officer, yeah. And by the way, just for the sake of things, I had to go, I had to go undercover. Chain, and that, that was crazy because I everybody knew I was agency and suddenly I had to go undercover, like try to explain that. Oh, I don't want to work for the agency, I'm gonna work for the State Department or something. That was that was crazy. Because that, that that rolls into the end of my career story, I'm sure you're gonna ask me about. But so I went undercover at that point to be a propaganda officer, uh, sort of running people around the world doing crazy. And I mean, do you do you go to a propaganda okay. school or do you receive like mentoring oh, from some of the right. other people in the office? How, how does that work? Oh, that's a good question. I've got that question. Yes. Um, the answer is no propaganda school, although Sherman Kent School had some really good training on writing and analysis and processes and uh, the training OTS, like the training division, uh, not technical services, but the training services, they um, had some things that I ended up being a trainer and propaganda in the training division for there for a while on, prop on propaganda operations. But it was, it was really sort of a commonsensical understanding how people react to media and just throwing some things out there when there was just all these sort of Neanderthal tools that we had. For us, it was like you know, cutting edge, but it was Neanderthal tools to try to figure out how do you get a message out and sort of figure out if that message is actually being effective or, or is that really important? It's just the fact that it's out there and we have ability to spread and the process actually works. I was big on effectiveness. So what's the point of doing something if, you, if it's just- Right, you want, you want to move something. Yeah, exactly. What's the point was my biggest question. How much money do you have? How much time do I have? And what's the point? Those are my, those are my three questions all the time. So what were, you, what were you looking at at that time frame? I mean, this is still, the Cold War is still going on. Um, well, can you talk about some of the tasks yeah. you got, some of the things that you guys were concerned with that you were looking at? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, kind of when I walked into the 
the first the first day at the in PPS, the uh, there was a lot of stuff about Berlin Wall. Reagan, Reagan decides to get in front of this thing called the Berlin Wall of Gorbachev and say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And that kind of changes your daily schedule for the next couple of months. So you are, you are now working on how can we affect or push the Reagan anti-Berlin Wall stuff. So you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's quivers in your, that you have. You don't know if, how effective they're going to be, which one you're going to use. But there was the, the fall, the, the Berlin you know, the Soviet bloc was falling apart, all right? So what can we do to help that out? Um, like I said, I, when I was training, I used to start my training as my job was to cause the Soviets pain. That was sort of like what I, I thought of every day. And the, and, and the narco-terrorists and state-sponsored terrorism, which was brand new. Gaddafi and those guys were brand new. Um, it, was not, and it was not just this other sort of stuff. You know, Abu Nidal was running around. There was hostages in... in, in in Beirut, so there was so, the, so, some of the some of the the Palestinian groups had KGB support, didn't they? Yeah, I didn't do as much. Let's see, what did I do with the Palestinians? Probably not as much as I thought I did. I was more on the uh, on terror Soviets, terrorists, terrorism, state sponsored more than anything. Uh, although I'm sure I did something back then. I can't even remember thirty years ago. There was things were just flying, and they and. It takes a while, and you're, you're looking back at rose-covered glasses. I'll look how important I was with all these things. You know, some things are more important, some things aren't. You're killing time. You're reading FIBIS reports, trying to figure out a foreign broadcast information service reports, trying to figure out what's 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 news. And then you come up with a crazy idea, where someone says, "We need this." And you say, "Okay, I'll go do it." And, and I had a team of people who could. They were they were great. You know, suddenly uh, when I started, when I was still in DI, like I told you uh, earlier. You know, Achille Laurel was taken. All right, so hot ground ground branch is right around the corner from my office, and they would come in and they would watch my TV, and I'm popping pictures of the Achille Laurel deck plans in real time as they're showing them on TV because I get it faster than they can. Oh, cool. rip it off and hand it to them. All right? So there's like a heli like a news helicopter overhead. Oh, it was the actual plans of the ship. Someone had pulled them out of the ship registry or something, <laughs> and there they were drawn, and they were they were scrolling across the deck plans. And I had this little printer on top of my TV and I could take actual, real time prints off of it. So oh, I'm wow. popping, they're over my shoulders going, take that, take that, take that, take that. And so I top it and I figured they're getting a little, just a little bit faster than they would through their own sources because they're right, literally right around the corner or within feet. And so, you know, you feel like you're good, you're in a good mood. And then, you know, uh, there were revolutions happening and they were happening on television. And so I, pushed the video at that time as a video zealot. And I carried that over into the operations side where in the DI, I was sort of tired of watching things happen. I was tired of watching uh, uh, hangings and shootings of Americans and, and, and just, and I watched a space shuttle blow up about 2000 times. That happened just after I got there. And you know, the, the space shuttle commission was on. And all that. So there's all this sort of stuff so I wanted to do something about it. So I was glad the operations guy said, hey, come over and let's do something. So that's why I was glad to go over and sort of change careers into the, how can I stick, stick my thumb in their eye? And I didn't have any peer. I wasn't taking somebody's job. I was, it was made it was sort of me. And it was go, you know, and the, and the agency tests you. It's like, here's this impossible thing I want you to do. Make this impossible documentary or video or get this thing there and show us you can do it. And that's how they know if you're viable or not. And so you, you do your best. You know, they throw, it's one of their training things, throw you into impossible situations and see how you get out of it. You know? And I think we did, we did okay. Is that the type of thing they would have you do? Like you mentioned making documentaries? I would, like I, I, was, I was willing to use any tool that we had at our disposal at the time, or at least consider it. Now, and, and you gotta remember, this is TV. There is no internet, Zippo. Mm -hmm. All right. There's no digital Zippo. There's no, there's, there is broadcast television. Satellite TV is new. There's Face the Nation, Meet the Press. There's foreign language broadcasting. There are television newscasters around the world. There are documentary films around the world. There are films around the world. There are TV novellas around the world. Music videos were becoming a thing. Um, and a few others. What could we do? What could I do? What were they asking me to do that I could have felt that I was making something that had impact, rather than just doing it because somebody wanted to show, hey, look, 
I got somebody who can do this stuff. Look how cool we are in our division. Uh, so some of those, I tried some of my didn't. So I'll talk about some of my won't. I know I, I'm actually in there. I haven't quite finished it yet. I was listening to Wind of Change, which is about the Scorpions and the, doing the song for the Berlin Wall. I don't know anything about that. That was a little bit after my time. But yeah, would they use music? Yes, agency always used music. And we always used images. We always used whatever we possibly could. And as I said to you earlier, nowadays I have no clue. I'm sure they're saying, ah, oh, there's this thing called TikTok. How do we use TikTok for our advantage? How do you use Snapchat? How do you use Instagram? Because those are the tools of today. And before me was 16 millimeter film and it was microfiche and whatever it was, they had out their tools. We were, we were, I was in the transition period from that stuff to sort of the more broadcasting broadband world. And it was, it was somewhat fun. And uh, it sort of took a hit there Actually, I think uh, Iran Contra sort of shut us down. The covert action stuff got a little bit dicey through a lot of stuff that's happening like late night, late 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, the Berlin Wall was down. You know, the Oliver North stuff was up. I'm fine, I know Ali, but so it's, it's, it was sort of shut down a little bit. They were talking, about, don't do anything right now. I'm like, I don't, want to, I don't want to not do anything. So I had to change careers inside the agency. Some, somebody already asked about winds of change and if uh, the agency had a hand in that. I got no clue. If I had a clue, I wouldn't tell you. And if I, and I, because I don't have a clue. Is it, is it possible? I haven't finished the doc. I haven't finished yet. I got a few more episodes to go. Is it possible? Sure. Think of Argo. All right. Did the agency have relationships with Hollywood? Sure. Okay. It's proven. I had pal. Did, did, would it have friends in the music industry? Sure. Did it have friends in the broadcast television industry? Sure. I mean, those are, there were there were weapons. There were not weapons. They were resources at our disposal. So I got no clue, and I wouldn't tell you anyway about winds of change. But the idea of music videos as a tool, it wasn't the was laid out as a possible thing to do amongst many other things. Um, not anything. I didn't sit. I didn't sit around the table. And go. Let's check off the music video boxes. You know, they ask questions, and you know. I, and then you say, so yeah, you can do that. You can do a film, you can do a television program, you can do a video, you can do all these things. It's, they are things that we were, get, um, I mean, there was always broad, I mean, television been around for, has been around for a while and, and imaging and those types of things, but there was sort of new, a little bit more, um, distribution was a little bit looser. And now it's wide open, but it was loosening up. So yeah, it was, it was one of the things that I would get asked about I was always sort of asked about what are the chances, which is a big problem, of it blowing back into the U.S., which is illegal. All right. right. So, um, if you're going to do a movie, TV, music video, by rule, you can't have it blow back into the U.S. to impact the U.S. people unless you get a congressional write-off waiver or something. Oh, wait, oversight committee or oversight committee reports. So uh, that was where I got asked a lot of questions about that um, because I'm didn't want that. And if we ever did anything, because we had Reagan, all right? So Reagan was a big video guy. If we ever did anything for him, CIA emblem at, at the front, so he knew it came from us in case anyone wanted to leak it or something. You know, we're not letting him know it's propaganda. It came from us. I was big on that. I was, I was follow the rules, policy stuff. I know um, um, Army Psychological Operations, they produce documentaries. And yeah. you, the, the, the people who re receive these documentaries and watch them in foreign countries, they have no idea that no idea. the United States funded them. Hope not. They're, they're made by locals. Um, so it, it, the, the United States is really like, they're very much, uh, the PSYOPs guys are behind the scenes on it. But that's, uh, it's, it's white side propaganda, so to speak, in that it's, um, there's nothing really nefarious about it. It's just about influence. So right. you're making an anti-jihadist documentary. Right. Like, hey, this don't, don't join a terrorist group. These guys are real bad news. They destroy your family, you know, that kind of thing. But could you explain the difference between that, what PSYOPs does, and what you guys did in your office when you were in operations? I did them both. I, I actually was a big believer in the impact of truth as a propaganda weapon. I mean, you did. Well, I worked on Afghanistan till my brains oozed out. I mean, that was, and very proud of the work that I supported the Afghan group. We had somebody dedicated to that in our group, and she would come and say, "Hey, can you help?" and and I would and I would do my thing, you know. And you didn't have to make that up. I mean, there were 
they toys were exploding and blowing off their arms and hands and killing children. That's that's not propaganda. That I, I thought that, I thought that was one you guys made up. Oh, that was yeah, exactly that whole thing about killing children. We did that all the time. But they, they, it was like exploding teddy bears or something. Exploding like teddy that. bears, exploding toys. I had the video. I mean, this is it's horrible. Really? And I had I actually had a, my favorite video I ever had. It's got to be was a stinger shoot down video. I think it was one of the first stinger shoot down videos, and it was probably about 15 minutes of somebody with their camera while looking at their feet, and all I'm seeing is really bad feet in really worn sandals flipping over rocks in a pet in a path, running around, just bouncing all around, and suddenly the camera flips up, and there's a couple guys on a hill, and it's beep beep beep, Akbar, poof. And they all and I cool. You know, I just think we shoot down to it. But you have to go through 15 minutes of some guy's crappy feet to get there. How do you use that? I mean, I mean, it's a it, by the way, that's where you talk about the not the dark stuff, but you know, propaganda is one thing. It's communicating. It's all about communicating. All right. And some people everybody receives things differently. We'll get to we can get to that later. But you know, if I'm supporting our efforts in Afghanistan. And we're dealing with the mujahideen. The mujahideen. How do you communicate what the people are asking me to help them, or our group? Uh, like, how do you how do you use this device, this thing? How do you communicate this? How do you do this particular process? And I don't speak any of the dialects, and none of us really did. So we need to use imagery and communicate and, and graphics and pictures and things, and to to communicate that. That's the easy part. The hard part is how do you get that? to the mountains of mm -hmm. Afghanistan so you can actually watch it, All right? So you think about what do you do to do that? And so you work with the guys who are really smart, say we can do this and we can do that. And you know, there's, there's donkeys and there's batteries and there's, and there's uh, shock absorbers and you put them over the mountains and, and they push the button and not they can watch things. So, so it, was, it, was, it was really kind of a fun job because not one day was sort of the same. How do you help us fight a war against the Soviets? How do you influence their media here? So, so it's, it's not just that you, you have to introduce the propaganda. You have to introduce the technology for them to view it on. Yeah, well, they had to view it. I mean, they had to say, hey, we need to show them how to use this thing, this mortar, this gun, whatever it might be. How do, how do we, and we can't communicate. How do you do that? So we used video and graphics to do it, but you got to get it to them. So you had to create with their help, of course, they know how to do it, the ability to get that to them. So it's actually in good shape when it gets to the point of you pushing a button that's not worn out, stretched, full of dust. Um, how do you get to push the button? So those are, those are, I'm not the technology guy, but I can think of ways to get those things done with, with their help because they're pros. So, but you had to, but the point is, how do you communicate to people you can't speak, talk to? And not only you can't talk to if they were seeing what three feet from me, how do you communicate to them when they're 6,000 miles away from me? Right, and that was that was some of the problems. That was the fun can, challenge. Can you tell us about some of the projects you worked on where you were trying to you were trying to move the chess pieces around the chessboard, where it was a little bit more than just influence or training or something like that? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I wrote the book and uh, my first book, book two. If I, any agents out there I'm looking for you, um, uh, the first book was a was auto autobiographical, but uh, any resemblance to living or dead is purely coincidental and a figment of the author's imagination and approved by the agency. Uh, not approved, sorry. It was reviewed, not approved, re reviewed by the agency. Um, and I was, there was a, there was a, there was a project that had a deal. I, I, I'd say it's a Libya project because the book's about Libya. And we had, we were trying to get a message, true or not, to certain individuals and it required uh, total covert action, basically. And and it was it was. Um, I'll make sure I say this correctly, that I don't end up in Leavenworth. That you know we we created a fiction, all right, using the type of Argo things that might have been brought up in real world, not just a cover, but as in real world stuff. And uh, this fiction we hoped would in would cause action by the person or two or three that would be to our benefit at least at least really cause some tension amongst the gang which i think Desta was, destabilization yeah make them sort of wonder who's what where when, how which was good enough for me um good enough for the people who asked me to do it 
And so we did. And then of course, we, you could making something is easy. You know, it, it was fun and it was this and that. But once you had it, it's like, how, once again, like the mood thing, how do you get it to them? And then this third part is how do you know if it was effective? But getting it to them required- well, When you say it, what is it? it and it was, well, there's this, this fictionalized video that we made okay. that was getting across them that something had happened that necessarily did not really happen. But if you watch it the way that we did it, it could make somebody think that this thing would happen differently and they may be upset about that. And they, or, it, or actually in a larger community, it may leak out and create some angst because there was already some um, question about whether this particular bad thing had really happened. It was rumor, we were trying to make it sort of true. So uh, at least uh, pure true. So we did it. How do you get it to them? You know, it's videotape. So you take a videotape of some popular movie. It's all we had. You know, how do you, how do you get something? How do you create a backstory that makes it real that this thing existed in time and is not made up by me and a couple other people and a gang of thieves that this actually is re, looks real, is valid. And that's the next step. So you go through a series of finding the, the mechanism, the tool to get it in front of them. Uh, the, 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 they, the, the operations guys, they had people, that's not my department. I, I, I need to put something in their hands. So um, how do, how, who, what was the most logical way that this person may have this particular thing? So the, they created the backstory, I created the material, you embed it inside a, a video, a movie, some common movie in this common area, and you crash edit it, which is what somebody would do, basically two VCRs, click, click, VCRs. Those are big boxes that have videotapes in them, not, you know, not, it was, it was, you click these two things, so it's a crash, and if it crash edit, it's get this, get this rainbow effect that goes across the screen that shows it's actually sort of done dirty. And so if anybody was technologically looking at this, they'd say, oh, that's, that's not a professional edit job, that's somebody pushing two buttons. Right, right, that's some gorilla two, stuff. With two cords in their, in their bathroom, uh, it looks that way. And, you, and then they take it to where they gotta go. And I'm done. And I'm just kind of asking the, my sponsors, anything, anything? And I was told that they had sources and methods that said that there was an impact by this. That's all I know. I got a performance award for it, yay. But uh, uh, so that was actually, and that's why I decided we're gonna write a book about this crazy thing. It's sort of the background you know, of this Libya. It was a Libya thing, but it was a background of this thing. Um, I just imagine like this, like some sort of like quasi CIA Hollywood production. And there's like Joe dressed up like an Arab <laughs> sheikh with a prayer Not beat me. in his hand. <laughs> we had people and they had to, the peop, you had to have the right dialects if they spoke. Mm -hmm. You had to have makeup. You had to have uh, buildings and foliage that would match where this was supposedly taken. You had, and we actually, I actually brought in a vehicle that was of the time and date and license plate that would match that time and freight. And so, just looking at it, it's for what I was. I mean, I'm not an ex, I'm not an, an, air, an, an expert on that area, and I had, you know, I did my research, and people who were experts look at it and say, no, yeah, kind of maybe you wouldn't do that. Slower, faster, bigger, smaller, and by the way, it had to be not taken by a professional camera. It had to be taken by a certain right. kind of camera. So you had to go out and get the certain kind of camera that was from that area, bring it back and actually shoot with that kind of camera. So someone would say, oh, this wasn't shot with that. It was actually right. shot with a Sony Betacam, Betamax with professional lighting. No, it was shot wrong. The, the way it's shot, the way it's edited, it all has to appear amateurish. We didn't edit a thing. We ran it straight, because which is what the story was. So and you know, any editing would have been a tip off. So it was just start, start the scene, let it roll, end scene, and let it, and then look and off it go. And and you know, those are fun. And it, you know, it's unique. And you know, if you want to, you know, I'm, I'm looking back at road colored glasses and the like. But you know, it was it was unique. We were told it was unique. We were told it was different. We were told it was effective, which gives you some sense of pride 
right? That you might've had a, made a difference for that brief moment in time. Um, it's 30 years ago ish. So it, it, you know, it's, it's ancient history. Now it's the, that's the middle ages in the intelligence world and, and communications. But uh, you know, in my time, it was, it was a fun thing to do. Uh, and that was I, probably the, now, and I did a few other, I mean, there was, you know, I, I liked, I liked making things that they didn't know was made by us. Mm -hmm. I had a mind overt things. I really liked, um, in the 90, in the eighties, you know, television, U.S. television was, was really hot. U.S. movies, directors were really hot people. And to be able to get your stuff to into the areas that you want, you could use that to your advantage. You could use uh, desire to have serialized television, or you can use uh, maybe a conference or something to be able to get what you want into people's hands, which doesn't happen sort of nowadays because conferences are different and don't need it because you have digital. But back then it was you had to get on a plane and go somewhere and stack your stuff on the table and here, here you go and go buy it. That was not my, I was not the seller. I, I would support those people and I support the people overseas. I would travel around to different areas to support whatever they had going. I, uh, you know, I, I have nothing to add really. Um, I, I just say, you know, when I've asked about, um, about what you guys were doing at that time, I was told that your office did some pretty epic stuff. Um, so some people, pretty... I mean, I left, I, I, I left for various reasons out of that department. Burmese, she kind of shut us sort of down a little bit. And I kind of want to do different things. I've been doing it for over three years. And it was, it was I'll, I'll tell you, let me tell you something. For people who have careers and lives. And that was, I was in that department pretty much from 87 to 90-ish. That was the really only job I've ever had where I hit the ground running every morning. Like, let's go. You know, it was, it was the job. <laughs> that was fun. After that, everything kind of became a job. All right. You got to, you know, they're fun. It's a job. It's nice. But that was the one that was like, let's do it. Let's. Let's pound some people. Let's think. Let's think creatively. And I got in trouble, or not. I got pushed back on. You know, <laughs> policies were against me. You know, laws are understood. Ethics, I understand my ethics. But policy, the agency's policies are rigid, and so I wanted to do some things, just simple things, like use a narrator. Well, that narrator may be somebody who's employed by another element that we cannot touch like a professional news organization or journalism or something. I couldn't use them even though I wasn't using them as in their position as a media person. Because of the church they had great vocal findings cords. and yeah. Yeah, yeah, they had great vocal cords. I needed them, all right? And I, but I couldn't because policy didn't allow me to do that. I got flustered, let's just put it that way. Can you tell? Um, Can you give any other examples if you're, if you're allowed to of, um you know, sort of the, the surreptitious productions that were not supposed to have any agency fingerprints on them. I think it's really interesting. How, <laughs> the attention to detail you put into that. Yeah, well, I think that was, that one's the one where I had to go from A to, from idea to figure out, to, you know, find out that it actually had an impact. I got, I got to think about this for a second. What are those, I mean, because a lot of what I did was get pro- pro-US, neutral, anti-them elements into the electronic media, all right? Whether it be by news, which is kind of where I, I was kind of a news, so that's kind of my thing. Um, there were longer form things, but that was not quite my expertise. We just had as our, that was somebody else's. Um, I'd support them, but that was not. But I was sort of, how do we get people who are communicating to the masses communicating what I want them to communicate, but what I was told that we should communicate by the perspectives. Um, and so that requires them telling me, hey, we have an asset in X country, they have access to blank TV station or blank radio, whatever station, how can we use them? All right, what can you do? And so you kind of go, okay, we can, they're on air, we can do some on air. They, you know, if they're if they're doing speeches, we can do speech, whatever it might be. Tell me, tell me. And the problem, the, what, what's frustrating about that is, once it's gone, I got no clue. I have no no idea, even if they even used it, even if our people are monitoring the news. I asked them, can you please monitor? Let me know if it's using. I don't know, 50-50, I can't remember the numbers, but it wasn't all the time 
because really they just wanted our materials and wanted the money. But uh, you know that that is that was a program all the time. That was a program. I was popping out news every week, every month. That uh, that sort of leads me into something else I wanted to ask you about because I've I've been told that during the Reagan years, um, really during the Cold War the CIA had a global disinformation campaign. Like nowadays it's targeted at a specific country. Like they'll have a disinformation campaign for Iran, for Iraq, Afghanistan, whatever it is. But back then there was a, a global campaign targeting communism worldwide. And it was shut down at the conclusion of the Cold War. Um, I just wanted to hear, you know, uh, well, first off your thoughts on that. And if, you know, you think it's a mistake to shut it down if we should have something like that today. Well, once again, I left and I sort of had this ethical body thing that once I've left a position because of uh, compartmentalization, that stays. When I left the agency, I threw away my, my card files and I, I, I should not have communication with them because I, that's them and they need to be protected. So I, I, I will say that I didn't follow until 9-11 when things all, when all hell broke loose, but the, um, we, I was told to, to go after big topics, you know, the, the Soviets and narco traffickers and, and terrorism and spit, say sponsored terror. There's I think some other ones. And there was coups all over the place. If you're in Angola, if you're doing Cuba, don't kill Cuba, go get Cuba, um, get Cambodia, whatever it might be. So, but if, uh, if the Soviet or the Polish people because you know solidarity was was going on, or the German desk, or whatever it might be. Because mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I was just I was just reading up on this Prometheism in Poland. Yeah, well, I I did some support for some of the stuff that was going on there, but we all did. I mean, it was it was it was Lech Walesa and crowd. But it was so you know if there was a if there was a big program that the Bert Gerbers and Milk Beard and all that gang you know were, were firing off. All, that's their department. I would get called up in these meetings and say, hey, we need to do something in this narrow thing. Can you help us with this narrow thing? If not, I'm doing my normal news uh, cultural impact thing. And so I would get called and some of them I would shut down with my three questions. How much time do I have? How much money? And what's the point? All right. I'm not Steven Spielberg, guys. All right. We're not going to make here a movie or video and show how creative we are. I don't want to do that. There's lots right, of great right. stuff on the show that does that, all right? You need that impact. So, because it was a new tool. I was, it was like, ooh, look, I got this tool, this video thing. Um, so, you know, talk about disinformation. I, I, I always fell on the side of, I'm just giving out the truth. And if that truth happens to be biased, which is whatever we all are, to our way, fine by me. If it's, if it's neutral, fine by me. Are there, were there, of course, real, large, organized disinformation things? Certainly. I mean, the history books show that. I was my piece, all right? And I, and, it, and you know, there was, there were the things saying, go after the Soviets, all right? It didn't say go after the Soviets this way or that way. It was go after them. And that was, and I had the video thing, at least a piece of the video thing. There were certainly other video people overseas doing their things I had no connection to and should not have connections. I was doing my piece as a headquarters base officer that kind of traveled around. So, Yes. Are there were there big projects? Yes. Were there subsets? Yeah, that was sort of me as I got caught up in a big project. And part of it also was uh, I know you were the video guy, but also article writing that the CIA would place news articles in newspapers around the world. Yeah. Well, the the article, I mean, the print guys are right around the corner. But I mean, I was the video. The, the techniques are the same. but they're kind of the same now. You know, if if I wrote my news thing, my goal, my hope. Would be, would be replayed in, in the well, what I would say now what we call viral, but back then viralism was very difficult. So I would you would place the so and this was the Soviets were great at it. I mean they they would place a story in a newspaper in India, and that newspaper story in India would get replayed in Romania or East Germany or wherever, and then it get picked up by regular media, and off it would go, and it became viral after six months or five months, whatever off the print world, because that's what that was a technique and that was stuff. We all had the same tools. You know, I got a newspaper, you got a newspaper, all right? I got propaganda guys, you got propaganda guys. I got case officers, you got case. And we all had the same tools. This is how we were applying them at the time. So when video came along, it comes along, it's how, how do I 
emulate that to make video go viral. And a short news clip on some news station in X country has a lot less capability of being viralized back then. In fact, it was very almost nascent. Uh, then today we're going to be digitized and sent off to everybody at the same time. Stories are Twittered in the second and off it goes and it can be viral in a moment. Our viral took forever and you never even knew how the impact was. So it was the exact same tech. We were fighting the exact same techniques. The print techniques, which were traditional, were the techniques I tried to head only, that's all I had. Emily, although we had uh, people at TVs, right? Every, everybody read newspapers, everybody did something, but people, people watch TVs. People in the Soviet bloc were clustering in their little apartments watching US movies. All right, by themselves, you know, stick. You know, uh, there's a program. There's a name for it. I'm just in my age, beginning right now. But that's how they, when they were selling them and making, they were dubbing them. This one lady was dubbing them, and that's how they got uh, into the West. I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with that. They were doing it on their own. That was homegrown. But that was a video. You know, that was there was they, they people were dying wanting it. All right. Uh, if you're gonna do. If the Soviets or the whoever they're going to be are going to do their video on the World Communist Congress, or whatever they're going to do, we're going to do one saying it's not any, not any good and put it through our channels too, right? They're, you're being controlled by them. So the distribution techniques were still you know, sort of the rudimentary ones, wrap it up in brown paper and ship it off in the new, wherever it goes. You know, the digit, there was some limited digital transition, but little. I was more into videotape, which is what was, which was our weapon, um, and that and you know, it lasts until digital comes along, and then you know forget videotape. Who wants a video cassette recorder? Do, do you think that uh, you know if and when the the full extent of the CIA's propaganda efforts overseas, which you know that were they were lawful and legitimate and undermining uh, communism, but. I mean, do you think if the full extent of it was declassified that the American public would be pretty shocked to learn uh, how? We'd be, everybody's shocked and anything they don't know about. I don't know about the full extent of the history of the agency. My mentors were part of that, all right? And when things were, things were dismantled under the Carter administration, I came in just after that, and we were in the rebuilding phase, the scaffold, um, to put it, to put it back for Afghanistan, all right, for anything. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, a lot of the historic institutional knowledge and, and of the past had been wiped out, as, as I was told. And I was sort of the new team that was brought in by a couple of the remaining old team, which is geniuses. People had been at the trenches and up to their neck in swamps and wherever it might be, to move us from then to now. What the extent of the agency's historical propaganda operations are, you know, some of them are horrific. I'm, you know, you're talking about Central America in the 50s, all right? You're talking about things that, you know, overthrowing of legitimate countries and things that they, they're not my department, right? We can, this, we can discuss foreign policy and rights or wrongs, another thing, and the, and, the, and the newspaper articles and whatever was being done then to support the agency stuff was done to support the agency stuff that they thought they were doing the right thing to support the, the, the foreign policy of the U.S. And then, that's their time, all right? And people may look back on my time and stories I'm saying now saying, you fool, you know, you, 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 what were you doing back then going after narcos and terrorism and, 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 and subverting people's thought processes? You know, you idiot, you know, we, we need to be you know, open and tell everybody things. I, I don't want to know. Right? They, they did it. They're patriots, right? The people who are doing it now are doing it. They're the patriots. They're the people who, are, who no one knows are up to their necks, who are spending their time, they're not getting stock options who are making a difference. They may be in the military, which has the largest PSYOPs operations in the world, and on our little agency thing, whatever it might be, you know, it, it changes. When 9-11 happens, that changes the perspectives, right? That changes what happens for propaganda operations and the goals. You know, it's all terrorism all the time, right? And now we're in the 2020s, and it's the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and all, all them all the time, probably. I'm not, I'm not, but, the Russians and the Soviets have been there since the beginning of time, but um, you know it changes and the techniques changes. The, but I'm, I hope, I hope that there's this large programs to help out the American, or at least what has been decided 
on the things that our foreign policy leaders want to communicate about the foreign policy and the issues of the United States of America, which change radically. You know, I came under Reagan, I left under Clinton. This just because it's a different president. And that's, that. Uh, I'm not political. Well, I'm not political from the point of view of my job. You know, tell me what to do, you're gonna do it in essence. I mean, I mean, I know there's, the agency was changing and has changed from its mission over means world and it became politicized and, and uh, maybe changing back, but that's, I'll read the same things you read. I just know my time. So what ended up leading to you leaving the CIA and, you know, landing at your next job? How did all that shake out? So I rum and coke. I got to keep myself lubricated. Um, Go for it. Keep yeah. it coming. I'm actually out of rum. I've got like, honey, honey, ding, 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 ding. Um, I, I really, um, I went and did classical uh, espionage or um, recruitment stuff in the DC area where I was based, which was kind of fun oh, really? and interesting. Um, I was slated to go overseas. I did not come in as a career to CT or career training. I came in as a TV guy. All right, so I, 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 um, I don't know, impressed, whatever the word might be. So they put me through operations classes to go through the quick career training process to get overseas. And I, I, I wanted to go, I think overall, especially as a prop, don't, don't sneeze on me, especially as a, it's allergy season, believe me, I'm dying here. That's why I'm drinking. Um, That's why we're socially distanced. Yes, that, that plus it's allergy, it's pollen, it's ragweed. Um, and I would have gone overseas. I'd like to have been a propaganda officer overseas. We had slots, but there was just personal reasons. My wife, you know, there was building a family. Do you want to raise a family in the mm -hmm. American compound in Delhi? Or do you want to, <laughs> do you want to stay in the U.S., stay close to the family? My wife was very supportive of my intelligence world. She lived it. You know, most every spouse lives the life. We, we lived it in our home with visitors. But I did, just for me, it, it made sense that I had to, family over everything else so it was it was time uh, and I, and i had a, and i had a way to i had a, um, a plan for kind of several years to do in a, in a way to get out um i remember talking to some old timers i mean real you know black turtleneck old timers and saying uh, here's what i want you know what do i want to do and they're like well i said like well if i get out and they looked at me like i just said there's martians at the door now, who gets out of the cia i mean once you're in you're in. And sort of the Casey hires, which I was there under Casey, I wouldn't consider my, I wasn't hired under Casey, wouldn't consider myself as sort of a Casey hire. I, I, I plan sort of staying in, but situations and circumstances said I should, it's, I need to, to go. A lot of people now just get in, get on the resume and get the hell out. They look, I was working for the CIA and it's on my resume. Look how I am. I'm, and I'm gonna be on the staff on the hill and I got all this sort of stuff. Uh, and I looked at this guy and said, if I stay in, he looked at me like, what, you leave? You know, why would you leave this? And, and I, that mentality I, uh, was prevalent and, I, and you get it because you're doing these things that are unique and challenging and... Um, and, and that old school, those old school guys, right? That, that you mentioned, I mean, that kind of was that generation, right? That once you're in, you're in for life. Well, they walk up and say, hey, do you see this? It's an Agent Orange scar. <laughs> well, okay. And guys who are literally, I don't like using the word literally, but they were in the swamps of Laos up to their neck doing their jobs. You know, no one knows their name, and they're and right now there's a whole bunch of them crawling through the back streets of wherever, doing their jobs. And there's military people doing the same, who we're never going to know. I don't want to know them. We shouldn't know them, who are doing for us. All right, and that, I wanted to support them in my time. I, I and. and and I'm not, I only, the only big story I had was I was doing some stuff with the narco, against the narcos. And I did some stuff with Gulf War I. And I was, at, that's when I was in the field and I was collecting telecoms. So I was a tele, communications guy, so I was collecting telecom stuff. And uh, you know, I got another word for that one, but it's, it, it, you don't want any, you're not looking for it at a boy, though I have a big ego, as you can tell. But when someone comes up and says, you know, that thing you did saved lives, I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take the end day of the week. And that one project did, they told me. I didn't know. I would never have known. It wasn't asking. But after the fact, they came and said, the thing we did, that saved lives. And it's okay. And, and when you're told that you collected one of the largest amounts of intel on the telecom situation in Gulf War I, 
uh, you take that. That's you don't get a lot of plats on the back because you don't want anybody knowing, but you take what you can get. And those, so those kind of three things were sort of highlights of the of this crazy career inside. Uh, but I was standing on the shoulders of the people who came before me, and they they trained or taught, and I learned, listened. You know, you're talking like a Dewey Claridge, all right, the great Dewey Claridge, who mentor. I'll say his name out loud. I mean, he was a great guy, um, uh, crackly voiced, great. You know, I know, I know the Iran Contra. I know that, but to me, <laughs> I know, you know, I, I know all that. Okay, now we're, we're 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 living in a world where we realize everybody's not perfect. All right, like John, right, Adam, right. A historical hero or George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. Everybody's flawed, but for me, him and a few other people, you know, they they took you under the wing and they taught you stuff. I'm sure there's people doing it now. If I would have stayed in, you know, I'd be at 30 plus years, I would have been doing that to the people who followed me, gladly, because they did it for me back in the 80s. So I don't remember, I don't remember what your original question was, but. Uh, it was, oh, oh, what was your plan? You, so you get out of that, you decide to leave the agency. How, how does it work out? My plan was, um, well, I had to go to court. I needed, you know, I had to need a job. I needed healthcare. And uh, in the corporate world, Motorola, was seen as or was the benchmark for intelligence inside the corporate world. Bob Galvin, the CEO of Motorola, brought in Jan Herring, former CIA analyst, to, to start inside Motorola's corporate strategy office, an intelligence organization. Uh, Bob Galvin was on the President's Foreign and Intelligence Advisory Board, the PIFI app. And so all these CIA people would brief him and he go, wow, I need that. So he brought in Jan Herring and he created a global CAA-like unit, in the, CAA-like in the, in the sense of analysts. Uh, we're not, a, not as far as we're not ops, but analysts certainly to follow the competitors around the world, major issues around the world, patents around the world, technologies around the world, competitors. And that was handed down throughout time to one CA officer to another, all right? Everybody who ever ran the corporate group at Motorola this former CIA, and I was the last one. But I went in, I got hired to Motorola from the agency to uh, just looking for looking for an in. I went into a business unit to learn the business, and I could and they didn't have an intelligence system. So I set it up there uh, inside the Motorola group. And corporate intelligence, business intelligence, whatever it's being called, was becoming hot. All right, Jan Herring, Ben Galad, and a few other big names, they started this association of intelligence people. And as it had momentum. Uh, and so the world of competitive intelligence inside corporate worlds uh, was becoming a industry, along with finance and HR and things like that. So I was in on that. I got into Motorola in '94. I don't know what the agency '93, and I went in the business unit, stayed there for three years, and then I went into corporate, where I stayed until Motorola dissolved as a corporate entity. Um, and I stayed. I was number two there, sort of for. Well, I was number three for a while, number two for many years, and took over like 2005, six, and then ran the group until the you know, corporate dissolved and I got dissolved. Or maybe I, didn't, maybe I didn't do a good job. Maybe I wasn't able to change with the culture of corporate world. I always wonder about that. Um, did, I not, did I not help out our end users in a time of 2008 chaos uh, well enough and then show our value? So I don't know that. I know never did. But, so I went to Motorola and did it for inside the corporation for 16, 16 years. Made my reputation, that's a lot of these other things, inside the corporate world, I ran the National, International Association of Intelligence People, it's called SCIP, uh, was on their foundation, uh, did that for many years, uh, wrote articles, a lot more on ethics, because it's a big thing for me, and then uh, made a lot of great friends that Motorola made my, made my reputation then Motorola dissolved, I needed to get a job. So I fortunately had contacts in the political world. I didn't want to work US politics. US politics is crazy. So I wanted to work overseas, which is what I knew. I had actually contacts in the Obama administration. And they said, Ken said, hey, if you get laid off, um, Obama uh, campaign, not the administration, the campaign. They said, you know, if you get laid off, we're running, people are calling about how the 2008 campaign the magic dust, that social media dust that they sprinkled on this 2008 thing, bringing lots of calls around the world. Can you answer the phone for us? So I did, the world dissolved. 
got a job doing overseas work, running uh, international political campaigns or business managing, uh, business development for international political campaigns for about 10 years. Um, Ukraine, I was in the middle of a revolution in Ukraine for several years, Euromaidan. Um, we did, I think the last one I really did was Thailand with uh, President Tsai. Holy shit. Um, I didn't know you were you were knee deep in all that. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you about that. Um, but before we we move on, there are some uh, viewer questions actually um, that uh, some of the people watching this live have for you. Okay. Uh, Brendan G asks, is it broadcast media that has the most influence, social media, or a combination? Which new media will help us against RT slash CCP propaganda? Yeah. Well, of course, the answer, the quick answer to make my life easier would be they all have an impact. In fact, um, I was a lot of good, I, I read stuff, all right? It's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I was actually just read something from one of the, I don't know if it was the recent poll or if it was the, uh, the DNI just put out a couple of different uh, reports on re Russia and China and Iran. They did one today. In fact, yes. Today. And they used the words, somebody used the words traditional and social media. And traditional media is traditional media, broadcast TV, radio, Legacy media, print, all right? And social media. And I, I was interested in the fact they used traditional media uh, because social media is so much easier and cheaper and it's, and it's easier. Um, and, it's, and it's pervasive where, but I see what they mean by traditional media from 2016. So the question is, what do I, what was like, what do I think is the most uh, impactful? Um, how do I word this? Because I don't want, want to go off on some tangents, which I'm known to do. They're all important to segments of the population inside the US who use those for their news, mm -hmm. all right? 20% of people in the United States at certain age groups use social media to get their news. All right, which means they're probably less informed about politics than those who might use a variety. Most people, like 40 some percent, is, the survey just came out two days, three days ago. I haven't read the whole thing. I've read the, I've read the uh, summary. It's the 2020 Gallup and Knight Ritter Media Trust Media Democracy Survey, 20,000 surveys. And they, they brought up, and I, know, I teach this, I teach now, my end of my career is teaching, is most people use only a few sources for their news, for their information, all right? Depend, despite all the crap, we just are overwhelmed, we're gonna go to those. So what's the most impactful? The one that people use, right? So if you watch CNN and, and look at Daily Beast or Fox, and you watch Breitbart, whatever it is your sources, that's where the messages are gonna be, all right? And they know that, believe me, I guarantee you, the enemies of the U.S. that are listed have read this survey and downloaded it. They know how Americans use their information, what we think about partisanship and bias, what we, use, what we think about how many sources we use, how much distrust we put in media or trust we want to put in media, and we're hoping that it does because still Americans want the media to solve it. Right. They, we have a firm belief in our democracy that it helps the, the media in our democracy. It's, a, it's, an, it's ingrained in us. Although it's partisan now, we have this thing like that. Americans believe, I think it was the last one, um, you know, diversified news staff and things. But we're overwhelmed by speed, by messaging, by um, life to be able to filter it out. So what's the best one that to, to use? It's the one that people use to get their information. So I used to say back when I was at Motorola. It's kind of what, and what we said in political campaigns, in fact, they took a lot of stuff from that for the campaigns. It does no good to create a messaging campaign and run it on TV if yeah. the people you're trying to get to watch are on TikTok, on Instagram. Does you no good. You're over here, they're over there, all right? So you need to know what your target how they get their information. I used to ask my, this, I worked for the CEOs, basically, more, what do you like? How do you like it? You want PowerPoints? Do you want more documents? Do you want pictures? How do you, how do you 
want to receive your information because I don't want to give you PowerPoints and you want to read five pages. All right? I'm, I'm talking to a wall. And second question is, when do you want it? I'm not going to give it to you on a Monday morning when you're overwhelmed, but you want it on Friday or you're reading it in the car on the way home. Those, those factors are important on the effectiveness of messaging. All right? And I, my early life was just throw stuff out there and maybe it'll stick, I'll never know. Now you can know because you can see likes, you can see shares, whether they're true or not, because likes and shares and all this stuff can be botanized, right? They can be made up in numbers and things, but you, the world's sort of trying to figure out how these are humans and not, not computers, but it, makes, it only makes sense to use the stuff. If it's social media, I'm all in. If it's set cable television, which is probably the biggest one, I'm all in. Local news, which is still everybody's favorite means but to understand democracy and how they vote it, it's the local news service which is under attack um, by conglomeration bankruptcy pandemics i mean local nurses local newspapers local news is on is is waning so if you want to get how do you counter rt how do you counter ccp i'll say the one thing i told you earlier one of the first things i say and tell to my classes the weakest link in these systems are people all right, our people are biased. People have backgrounds. Bias isn't bad. Bias can be good, bad, can be indifferent. I don't really care. But where everything is biased, every entity, every industry, every person, every school, every podcast has a bias. And it's good or bad or whatever. And once you understand that, you can say, okay, now how do I interact with that? How do I teach people to be critical of a message coming to me? There's gonna be no tech, you, you cyber people who are listening and you, you technology people, I don't get, go do your thing. I don't get it, you're smart. You're, you're, the, you're the firewalls, you're all that stuff. I just like pushing buttons and I get what I want instantly. If I don't get it in three seconds, I'm going crazy. You do your things. The weakest link in this chain is humans, all right? And they know that. We know it too. It's not like as if we're just sitting around doing nothing. We're doing the same thing, although we're in a democracy and they quite they aren't. So it's a little bit easier for to get to us. So if if you want to uh, tell us, if you want, I, I, I'll pick. I'm picking things just because they're the Podesta emails, PizzaGate, uh, Comey back in 2016. Uh, if you want to do those, you're going to clutter that airwave with that message to influence the ability of people to look at other things, all right? And what happens, and shame on them, and they don't say much about it, is all the major media, the mainstream media, which I don't really like that, they're just, they're doing their job too. Um, they're picking it up. Right. And I don't think they were as critical as they should have been when they decided to run breaking news or whatever across the bottom, not everything's breaking news, breaking news across the bottom and say, Let's run this story from 24 hours ago about this topic that everybody knows about and fill up the airwaves. And, and the few journalists we have working for us are going to go do their job, but we're going to fill up airtime saying what they want us to say, right? Saying a story that could be true, could not be true, but has not been valid, verified, but it's dominating the news waves. So I right, think right, right, Fox, right. CNN, MSN, take your pick. I don't care. I'm not. Partisanship, you guys can kill me. I don't really care. But they all are filling time. They're picking up their stories that the Chinese or the Russians or the Iranians, more Russians and Iranians probably, because they, they all have different reasons why they're doing their stuff. Um, the Russians are probably bigger. They, they want to do a little more cultural, a little wedge, more wedge and split like they've done since the beginning of time. Uh, you know, we're, we're allowing them to do that because we're not, I'm going to say media literate, which I know is another buzzword that people don't like us, but we're not critical enough. And it's, just, it's the basic tools. You know, where did it come from? You know, memes, the danger of memes nowadays, or the viralism. So I know there's questions coming up. I could talk forever on this, but um, I might be answering other questions as you're going along. <laughs> but, but, but the best, the, what I, my main tool is educate people. All right. Get off of Facebook. All right. Go read something. If you're if you're in, if you don't believe it or it's just coming to you, be insatiably curious and do your job as a person and go find out if it's true or not. Yeah, it's the personal responsibility aspect. It's all about, and they know that we are not personally responsive. 
They know that we are quick, that our attention spans are down to seconds. It used to be seven minutes. I made every video back in my day at seven minutes because that's as long as people can, now it's less. So they know that. They know if they pick this, some whether it's fake or real or if it's a wedge issue or it's us versus them, they, they're, they, can, they can just use our innate anger, pain, hate against us. And, and we're allowing dis it to discomfort, happen. yeah. We're allowing it to happen. Uh, Matt asks, and I, I think you, you partially at least uh, already addressed this. Can you discuss how your department would monitor and assess your products? How do you determine if your products were effective? Back in the CAA days? I, I think that's what he's referencing. Yeah, and, and, I, told, and I said to it, and I kind of answered it. Yeah, well, I think so. That's always the frustration. And I would, I, I, I dreamed of the guy who said, hey, by the way, that saved lives. Or they, they call you in and they give you up to, up to the dining room and you get an award saying, hey, congrats, you did a lot on telecom. And, you know, usually, usually it's back then, certainly, it was throw it out for me in my world. See if it sticks. Now, if it's, and the print guys, they could probably see if it got replayed, if it got picked up by a news service, if it was on the newspaper, they clip it out, they could do some counting, and they could do circulation, and they could do all that sort of stuff. When I'm running videos, it's a little bit more difficult. So you have to, you have to put the uh, ego hat down and say, I believe I'm having an impact. I'm not gonna get the data. Nowadays, I'm sure they do. Now I'm sure with the di digital, they've got metrics, they can IP address it. They have a whole lot to understand. But back then it was do your best, forget the rest. Matt also asks, and uh, maybe you know what this is, has Joe applied Hallen's spheres to his work? No. I don't, first of all, I, I've heard it, and I'm not sure if I remember what it is. I'm getting old. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you I'll, it brings up a question about my own limitations and laziness and so whatever. I was sort of a brute force guy. And even all the way through is how do you got, you giving me a project. Um, there are, you know, messages getting to the next message and how it's being interpreted and it's being reinterpreted in different ways and being spread. There's all the, the theories of frame theory and all these other sort of things that are, that you know about cognitive theories, those theories. And I, I don't think, first I didn't have time. You know, time was very time, limited resource. How do I how do I make this and get this project done and then sort of move on to the next one to get the next project done? I wasn't very theoretical. And everyone wasn't theoretical then. Motorola was answered CEO's questions or leadership's questions. P political campaigns are a different story. So I I've never really, although I teach it in school, my work career has never been spheres or, or circle or things i just shame on me all right i'm just not that smart you know, i just get get it so, so I, I am actually gonna look it up i should write this down okay. helen's spheres um, it rings a bell it does ring this gray hair and bald spot and you know it it, it, it rings a bell so, so joe's first book which fictionalizes the libya operation that we were talking about earlier it's called secret wars an espionage story yeah. you can go and find it on amazon right now go go give it a read check it out um but uh, you also have a second book that you wrote which fictionalizes some stories from when you were working for this uh corporate uh quasi cia organization yeah. at motorola yeah it was, uh, so you want me to tell my Motorola story, the second yeah, story. Yeah, I'd love to hear First some of that of all, stuff. Secret Wars, I was a rookie writer. I needed better editors. I'm actually talking to somebody about now about re-editing it and putting it out, reissuing it. Um, if I have the time to go back and look how I can handle the fact how bad I was. Um, book two was, was better. And I shifted from the corporate world more to CIA stuff. But first of all, working in the corporate world, I was big on ethics and uh, big on getting the job done answering the leadership's questions. But every once in a while, at least once, so a crazy thing comes up where, you know, hey, I got a CAA guy on staff, go find this. And, you know, I got a tool, Ooh, look at me. I have a, I have a puppet, it's a CAA guy. And uh, it was back when Motorola was seeking out, 
I don't think I'm under non-disclosure on this. They can come and get me. I don't know where they are. Um, they, I know they took all my files, but that's about it. They, uh, searching for money when Motorola gave a lot of money with Nokia to the Uzan family in Turkey for a big GSM cellular deal. And the question that makes things short, it was they basically we get the money, those guys are the mob and they took the money and didn't give it back and pay back. And it was like, Joe, can you go find the money? Where'd they take it? Where'd they put it? Okay, I got a staff of analysts here and a corporate library. Now you want me to go across halfway across the world and go find a few billion dollars. <laughs> no so, problem. Yeah, I'm gonna have to sit down for a second and think about that. And uh, draw, it's a whiteboard moment. And so I called up my four agency contacts, some of whose names I've mentioned and things. And we started an operation. I had to get sources close to these people uh, through my contacts, all right? Uh, contractors and consultants, you know, we had to fund them. I, I told my guy, I told my people who uh, tasked me, I need money, money and time, all right? Because this, is, this isn't tomorrow, all right? And they're still probably doing the lawsuits and cases, I don't know. I did some research for book two on it, but that was a couple of years ago. So I had to uh, create a, a little mini intelligence operation. I had, we were encrypted, we were co-worded, or we had code, code names for people. Um, I had to travel to locations and, and meet for trying to figure out how do you get to finding a couple billion dollars in, the, in these people. So uh, it took, we had a lot of stops and starts, a lot of fakery going on for people. Oh yeah, I can help you. I didn't have I didn't have the resources to vet them enough to know if I'm being taken for a loop. Even my experience with people who are working for me, if they're being taken for a loop, and we get sort of close and back, close and back. And in the end, I I was told I we found it, and we had to prove it, and to prove it would require true espionage deception operations to get inside the facilities to get to the computers that can prove this and i knew i my company would not go for that i wanted to i've been on this for a year i, I was salivating in blood and i, I, I want to get this thing i want to get it you know, it's been non-stop for, for a year non-stop but i so i went to the people who tasked me the lawyers inside the company and, and they said you know you can't do that i knew they would they should, and, and they were right yeah. How did you even know where to begin looking? I mean, well, I had to rely on people who knew them and knew the knew the culture and knew the financial world, and who knew people in and around. I had to you had to create a beltway. You had to create a, you, you take the concentric circles and you start moving in, right? And I started way out here, no circles, and you start. And I took I got my people who knew Turkey and other places, and you just start getting closer, all right. And sometimes a step back, but we got it. Took we got to the we got to it. Uh, I know we got to it because they shut me down, but I didn't shut down. What I did was I told the network, which was not uh, was somewhat extensive, but not huge. But you know, there's there's compartmentalization here too. Um, the hold off, all right? No more no more proactive work. Just be ready. And they took it, Motorola went to the courts. That's how they, they decided to do the court way to get it back and was very successful. Um, I think, and, but the court people wanted some supporting documentation if what we were talking about was true because that gives them another place to go to, to go after stuff. And so three months later, the phone rings, hey Joe, do you think you can get some of that stuff legally to, to what? To, uh, in some way, or at least not through the ways I was talking about, which would have been things of, of mythology, of books and movies. And I said, well, ha, funny you should call. Uh, let, me, let me find out, but I had him still alive. So I made a couple phone calls and we were able to get some documents uh, through, I don't, none of us, no one would go to jail uh, that would, that proved it, or, or at least the bona fides of the fact that this is what the stuff was. And we handed it over, I handed it over, in fact, I handed it over some of my sources because I, which I really gave me heartburn, not the sort, not the deep sources, but my main consultants, it's cons main consultant to show that I wasn't just making this stuff up. I had to do that because it was like, how can you possibly, well, here's the guy who ran my operation for me. So 
I got him in front. Everything's good. And they took that. Eyebrows went up. I said, okay. And that was it. Game over. Network down. Go write a book about it someday. So that was that was not your usual go find what Nokia is going to put on their next phone or what the patents are doing or whatever are what's happening to this trademark stuff. That was a different inside world. I think that's pretty rarish. I was there for 16 years. That's one that I did. I did some other stuff, but that was the one biggie. How often does that happen? I think uh, it it's really interesting doing this for a corporation. And although what you were doing is technically more like being a private investigator than an intelligence officer, if you got arrested over in Turkey or somewhere like that, the government's not necessarily going to make that distinction. Well, Two things there. First of all, your your analogy of PI and intelligence is very correct. Uh, the skills of an intelligence person in corporate or anywhere are very similar to private investigators, very similar to journalists. Same sort of skill set, curiosity, writing, sources, methods, uh, confidentiality, same person, uh, interpersonal skills, very almost the same. We had occasionally we'd have to hire a private investigator to go, does this facility really exist? Does this person Live, really live at this house, you know, go walk by the house, let me know if it's really there. Um, but we would never, uh, ever do espionage. It's not the same thing. Corporate intelligence, because what we were doing, what any real company is doing, and espionage, never the, tw never the, never the bubble should meet, all right? There, it's, there are things that are illegal, there are things that are unethical in a, company, a company's policy that you will not do. Some company, along the spectrum of policy, companies are different. Along your own personal ethics, you're different. The law is there. Foreign laws, US laws, you know, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or whatever it might be, they're there, all right? So we would ne do not confuse corporate intelligence with espionage, it is not. And those who are doing that are wrong. It's, it's really interesting that you draw this very hard line because in the, the world I'm a little bit more familiar with the special operations veterans, the guys who go out to go um, work in private security, it comes up quite often that a corporation or a company will hire a bunch of former Green Berets or Rangers or whoever on the premise that, hey, these guys do whatever it takes to get the job done. And they start asking these guys to do things that are completely illegal, things like kidnapping mm -hmm. and a lot of times these soldiers these veterans are young guys and they're still psychologically in the military and it's like hey you are not under the auspices of the united states government if you go and do that it's completely illegal like you will probably end up in jail right um so like at least in, in my in my little corner of the world i see that you know my peer group gets sucked into that stuff uh fairly often and 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 has the difference first of all one is real time uh, physical security, real time. I mean, crisis management team. I, was, I do crisis management sort of the site. Um, like Kroll, back when Kroll was called control risk. I mean, they're there to protect mm -hmm. individuals. So if you need to go in and get a, a hostage taking situation to get somebody back, part of the game. All right, no problem. If you're gonna if you're gonna kidnap somebody to blackmail, whatever that, that's, I don't know nothing about that. We're, we're, I was, we we're more information people, collecting information, pretty much the DI. Um, I, I had this journey into the ops world back then, but we're collecting, we're collecting and analyzing. Now, post 9-11, I was actually called in that day or the next day, we were, I was a Motorola, yeah, we are called in that afternoon to the Motorola Crisis Center, which was across the, in our university compound. And like, they wanted to talk to some government people. So I got them on the phone with some people wondering, what's it mean to businesses that day? And uh, so they were, we were running down possible influences on US business or our business at Motorola, like supply chain issues and whatever it might be, and our broad overseas presence. What it would mean for us from the point of view of a uh, security issue problem. So then I created a program based upon that on doing a political risk analysis of our presence overseas, and it had to do with uh, personnel. Number one risk we had was uh, kidnapping of Motorola personnel overseas. So that's when your guys would come in and say, come and get us. But we had, there was legitimate physical threats 
to our right, fishing. Right. That's, that's a rescue mission. Yeah. That's a rescue mission or whatever it might be. So, I, so your world that you talk about, I don't know. I know what they're saying. But if, if there's an intelligence person, and it's a whole new world because you have data mining, a lot of stuff that, that you can do a lot from your desk. But if, if you know, if a good corporation that's in the box will use the tools they need to use, such as I did back in the day and the corporations use, and my box within that was we're going to do everything legal and ethical the best we possibly could. You know, that means saying no sometimes. That means saying, I'm, as I used to train on it, there's nothing worth your job. And there's nothing worth your reputation or the company's reputation. All right? There's just nothing. All right? If you want to, if you want to, if you want to fall on the sword for them, go ahead. But for people I'm talking to in the corporate intelligence world who are hardworking people who are fully undervalued and getting laid off, who are giving information like the DI so the CEOs of our company can make informed decisions about the businesses and hiring people and resources and employment, we can do that. That's what you're there for. Just go do that. If you get these crazy things sometimes, sometimes crazy things happen. You're not stealing the, the competitor's technology. If they're selling phones, go buy it. All right. Now, sometimes you get access to stuff and you have to decide. Remember when I first, in my little quick Motorola story, my first I was brand new in the business unit I was doing infrastructure, cellular infrastructure, towers, and base stations. And I walk up to my desk. And you know, my the motor group did bid and out. They did bids, all right. So they had books that every customer would get from all the people who were bidding on a system, and they would be opened by the customer and they would read them. And you're not supposed to have access to those. I show up at my desk and there's a book from one of our competitors that one of our people has gotten from one of their customers who decided to share it with our guy saying, hey, you know, here's what your competitors doing. And they put it on my desk and it's loaded with stuff. I know it's loaded with stuff. I'm not that naive. I know it's loaded with stuff. So I had that moment. All right. I'm sitting in 3G8, my little cubicle. All right. And I'm like, what do I, you know, there's a, here it is. Here's good intel. And I, so I picked it up and walked into the lawyer of the group's office and said, here, I don't want to see this. I didn't open it. I didn't look at it. You do, do something with this. It's not mine. It's good. Don't want to see it. You know, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Not everybody would do that, and maybe I did it. Maybe I was wrong, but at that moment, that was the right thing to do. It's when I taught teach taught ethics back in the day. What do you do if you're at a convention and some back when we had fax machines or somebody left their stick inside a computer at the business center that had their stuff on it, a competitor's stuff? What do you do? You know, if you're now that gets a little more dicey because they've lost they've lost custody. You know, right? So, so there's a little bit more leeway there, especially if it's traded trade. So, but you have to make the decision. And you're, hopefully your company has some guidelines. If not, go talk to the lawyers because they don't go to prison. But those are decisions all the time. That's what's happening in corporate intelligence. It's, it's, it's gray. Big, navigating the gray zone. That's it's, the uh, you know, I think that the army is part of the out process and they need to give these young guys, um, I, don't, I don't know, that, well, ethics training, maybe it's a little bit late for that, but that, like legal training, like, hey, if you're going to take a, a job with a private security firm, like you might want to have an attorney review that contract before oh, you sign it, um, you know, and ma making sure that they understand that you are operating under Title 10 authorities with the military. When you get out, you are no longer under those title authorities. Um, and that sounds very like um, pedestrian to you, Joe. I mean, you're a smart guy. You worked in this world for a long time. A 25 year old ranger getting out of the military like mentally, they, they don't get it. I, but the, they, yeah, just, there's probably a, either people doing it, there's a market for it, that for out for deep programming, whatever it might be, people who are coming, who, want to <laughs> right, do, right. Who, are, who are highly trained, effective defenders of our democracy in the military, who are now going into a world which is to make money. Right. Still stuff. And that took me a little bit to think, and I wasn't one of those people. I was, I was still... I was a operation. Right. You got a mission. It took me a while to figure out that my job is to help Motorola sell radios. So those sell, if it's in a base station, if it's on the phone, our job, my job is to help them make money, raise corporate dividends and help the stockholders. Not defend the constitution, not that it was make money. And that took me a while, even for me, the transition. And I actually thought for myself for a little bit back in old cubicle 3G8, you know what? I may want to go back to the government because I don't know. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't for me. That shows how bad it was for a second. 
but you know, I see stay in and you learn and you adapt. So it's maybe there is this transition for people to understand and because there are hard concrete differences between what you were doing, mm -hmm. and what you're going to be doing and how we, not what you're going to, but how you actually implement and the, the programs that you want to do. We've had some very smart corporate intelligence people in my career at other companies who made huge mistakes and they were trained. I mean, there's old, back in the old days, Procter and Gamble was, was in trouble because one of their contractors went diving into a dumpster, literally. I said literally again, sorry. They went into a dumpster stealing, trying to get documents out of the garbage. They trespassing, that's wrong, that's illegal. That's not, that's not what we do. To go, to go into a garbage is illegal? Yeah, it's called trespassing. Yeah. Oh, on their property. But once property. the garbage is like out on the curb. Yeah, but that's, yeah. Even then, I think I would say it's ethically and I probably don't do that. I know it's, it's, it's out of their control. There's better ways, all right? Because you can get caught and what happens when you get caught. But they right. got caught, all right? And so Procter & Gamble's in trouble. They're getting big, nasty headlines. Well, their CEO was on the board of Motorola. We get a phone call saying, go to Cincinnati. And so we pack up because we were a benchmark pack up our stuff, and we go talk to them, great people. They just made a mistake on how they control their third-party contractors. They didn't have a policy on that because the third-party contractor went off the reservation, right? And, but the company was Wall Street journalized for making for being corporate spies and all those others are a nasty PR that no company wants because they didn't have a policy. And that's because, and this person knew better. They, they knew better. They made a mistake, a big mistake. But that's the way it goes. I won't get any more to that. People, if any of my friends are watching from the old days, they know exactly what I'm talking about and who I'm talking about. They're all friends of mine. Even the people who made the guy, made, people who made the mistake, they're friends of mine. All right. They just made a mistake. Right. Joe, I, uh, I, I'm going to ask if uh, I can get you to stick around for a bonus segment to talk about the uh, campaign, the current presidential campaign. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts, narratively speaking. Um, because this is a subject of expertise of yours, where you see this campaign going. Um, but uh, before we do that, um, I did want to kind of like wrap up this part of the show, um, because you mentioned that you were, you know, knee deep in a couple revolutions in Thailand and Euro Maiden in Ukraine. Like, sure. how did that, what was that next phase of your career working um, and, and, and ending up in those situations? Well, the, the main revolution was in Ukraine. Um, we were working for, well, we were working for Yulia and then uh, a few others. And we happened to be there for Euromaidan, all right? And you take how you take your, your candidate who wants to be president in the middle of a revolution to uh, have him come out of the other side of the revolution as the leader, the person who was, who was seen as, the, as number one. Um, and Joe, this is legit. This is not a CIA operation. No, this we're is talking private. about. Yeah, man, I, and the company I work for, these are our clients. I'm sure this. It's, it's public, I'm sure I know it's public knowledge, but um, I still just always hesitate about some things. I know, I know. It's but, just uh, people you know, don't connect those them, dots, including me. I mean, yeah, I know. So, so if I gotta go back to my my mind here. So, how do you, how do you? Um, benchmark the messaging going on in the middle of chaos, all right? right. So you know, in December of 2014, the, the, the lawyers whoever tweet, meet in your own Maidan. Yeah, Yanukovych is a, is a thug. Actually, the fact that we lost the 2010 election because Yuli didn't listen to us is directly related to what's happening in Ukraine right now. I have a direct line to it. It's just disappointing. She should have won that election. It's just, anyway. Um, so, you know, so we were actually look data mining, you know, who, who were the influential Twitter people and bloggers who are, and what words are they using? Because our candidate was a policy walk. He wanted to talk about bureaucracy and new constitutions and things like that. And these people are talking about freedom and transparency right, right. And, and revolution, Maidan. And so our, we're, our messaging, is, his message is over here and the core of the things are right there. Once again, you gotta communicate what they are. So we tell him in no uncertain terms, that you can't go back to the old way of being backdoor deals, which is another phrase behind this behind backdoor deals, which all these people were born up, grazed in. You got to be the guy who's talking about transparency. Because by the way, here's your competition. One was uh, 
Klitschko, the boxer, and one's the Nazi. And you're like, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you dif differentiate? Because Klitschko's like this, and you're not. You know, he's a, in a revolution. Being strong and muscular is a good thing to be. So we you have to change the change the messaging. You know, you got to you got to publicly reject the backdoor deals. All right, and say we're for freedom. And by the way, you need to do them in three different languages. All right, because you speak Ukrainian, half the country speaks Russian, but you got to put it out in English, all right? Which is very minor, very low speaking, but you want to get picked up. You want that viralism. You want to become the New York Times tweet of the day, all right? That's how, you, that's how you get the people behind you. So you do that and, we, and you poll. You do flat out in the middle of a revolution kind of polling and you bring in the data people and you say, okay, these are the messages that people truly are interested in. We need to make sure that you believe them and you are into that and you are going to go for that versus the other guys who are still doing their rah-rah, whatever kind of things. So when this is all over, you're the likely person who is like coming out of the other side of the, of the, of the revolution as having shown leadership. Well, I mean, all revolutions are, are, are messy. Uh, he, Yanukovych left. Yulia was in prison and they, they let her go and they had an election and our guy actually did not win, but he got the position he really should have had, which is like prime minister. Um, he was, he's a policy walk. He's a guy and a guy. And so I don't know if he would have been a good president, but he's a good guy overall. You know, you're on the side of the angels. You do the best you can. You know, and uh, he, he had the job he should have had, and he's caught up in Ukrainian politics and Ukrainian corruption, Ukrainian world. Uh, but we're we're hashtagging all over the place. All right, you're twittering. This is 2014. Twitter still is kind of rel relatively sort of a new thing. Um, 20 in 2008, it wasn't even right. Hate. Right. It was, it was like a bit really like the Arab Spring was the first yeah. Yeah. time that it really got used for revolution. Well, look, and, and, uh, um, research those guys. Talk to a few. Uh, the Tunisia people about mm -hmm. the youth people, how they used uh, Twitter and talk to all of them about how they used the WhatsApp to, uh, and Twitter to organize their revolutions. Uh, we worked in Serbia and for the good guys. And uh, when the bad, when the idiot bad guy says, uh, I'm not rich, uh, come to my house, I'll show you. Well, first of all, he's a lying sack of crap because we know he's rich, he's got all these, how'd you, how'd you become rich as, Prime Minister of Serbia when you were and you were a grave digger was actually your job. Um, so if some idiot if he wants to say out loud, I'll come to my house. We're like all in. So we start tweeting out to the students of you know, Belgian University. Everybody show up in front of his house before five o'clock. All right, we'll take him up. We're not doing anything. Yeah, we're there, pal. And so you use Twitter to mobilize the uh, legitimately protest or a group of people who can get good pictures on in front of the guy's place because he's stupid. Um, or well, said a stupid thing, which all politicians do every day of the week. Uh, but we are able to use, at that point, social media to our advantage. And we're using TV. TV is still the number one means by which people get their information about candidates and, and messaging. And it's different there because they don't have, most countries don't have uh, political campaign commercials between pro, inside programs they block out certain sets of time based upon representation. You get this many minutes based upon you're big in the parliament or not. And you make a three minute, five minute, whatever it is. You have three minutes at the end of a program. And there's a block of all the political ads and you can do what you can for three minutes. You can do, wow. you can do five, you know, six, 50 second thing, you can do whatever you want. You want three one minute things, you can do one three minute thing. You can do whatever you want, but you, this is about a time you get. And so you need to adapt your messaging process and the support behind it because you're going to be firing out Facebook and Twitter stuff back. That's all you kind of had back then. YouTube was, was starting to grow, growing quicker. It wasn't around in 2008, hardly as a campaign tool at all. Um, 2012 more. And so this was 20, this is in that time frame. So, you know, you, you have to support one media with the, pro, with the other processes. It's not just, a, I'm using traditional media. It's, I'm doing that. Obviously, it's print and radio and yard signs, whatever it might be in the US. But there is controlled media by usually the ruling government, ruling party coalition, and how you can use that to your advantage.
what was it like trying to run a political campaign in the middle of a, a, a bizarre war? I mean, a, a bizarre, you know, like, geez, I hate to use the term like neo-Soviet, but I mean. Yeah. Well, it wasn't like when the campaign stopped. I mean, it was a, it was all revolution. I mean, this is this was a tragic, horrific uh, event of you know killing innocent people on the street, having their having the burk cut or whatever those guys are called. I mean, I've walked through the barbed wires. I was I was standing in the middle of these things, watching uh, the the people around, and it's so you're not campaigning. You're supporting the pro democracy. We we were the EU people. Our candidate was EU. All right, and then so they didn't sign the EU document. They they did the customs union thing. Then you know we're our candidate and everybody else sort of against that. All right, polling was pro EU, and so the campaign stopped for present. The campaign began for who's going to be the person that comes out the other side, being seen as the best person who handled the revolution. That's where we changed our messaging and focus to, for good or for bad, and it ended up okay overall, but still Ukraine. All right, it's still, they had their problems. But I, I don't, I, I, you guys who, the people who were with me in Ukraine are probably watching this. I don't remember all the polling exactly, but I don't remember ever seeing a poll about being fearful of Russia invading if Yanukovych loses the election. I don't remember seeing that. That was post, um, that was made up. I mean, that invasion just came along. It was, and the country split in two, almost 50 50. The, the middle, the Chewy Center was. Was kind of both ways, but pretty much you're Ukrainian or you're Russian, and then the sort of the people who looked west who were sort of in the middle. But I don't think I don't remember seeing that fear of Putin and Russia and the countrywide so research at that time was a fear. Although maybe we weren't able to poll there. I don't know. I'm not the pollster. Those guys are miracle magic wizards. But I just don't remember anything at that time about oh we better watch out because something's gonna happen military that it wasn't anybody's concern. Concern was transparency. Concern was coal and heat in the, in the winter and food and somebody who meets my, who's gonna support me ethnically. Oh, you're a Russian, I hate you. You're a Ukrainian, I hate you. you no, know, people are gonna get what they want. All politics is personal, all right? And it's the same everywhere in the world. And people wanted low bread prices and they wanted heat in the wintertime, all right? And they, and they wanted their leadership to, 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 to match their needs. I don't remember reading about possible military insurrection being a problem. We had really low on the list of things. So your, your candidate was running for president and he ended up as prime minister. Yes. And that's part of the parliamentary oh, yeah. system that Ukraine has that it's on yeah. coalition. Yeah, uh -oh. Poroshenko became president. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I argue it, Poroshenko owned the TV station, by the way. And when they were showing Euro Maidan Rebel, you know, they had a big stage in the, Euro, in the middle of Maidan and I know I, I call it made now, but I know there's an accent thing there. And he would show um, the live speeches and everything. And then when our guy came on, they cut to other programming because we were the number one rival for him for the for the presidency thing. And our guy would go nuts. Oh, he cut us again. Like, you know, you know, and I was, you know, I was not happy either because everybody else is getting live air, free time, you know, or, or you know, free media, and they cut us off because he owned the TV station or controlled the TV station. And he made good chocolate, good chocolate. And then you, you mentioned Thailand also, you were there for one of the kids. Taiwan. 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 Yeah, which was the, which was the most difficult um, geopolitical campaign. We were, we were engaged in help setting a yeah. strategy. And once the strategy was set, they decided to run it on their own, the whole actual campaign. So we went in with a few people and talked about how to do this mystical new sort of messaging and how to do a little bit different campaigning for, you know, the non, um, what is it? What's the, the, the Chiang Kai-shek party, KMT, richest party in the world of money. So plus you had, you know, you had the you know, Taiwan Straits, you had the, the two countries, one party. It was, it was, we were, we spent days talking to people, experts, historical, trying to figure out in our own little American minds, the complexities yeah, of the yeah. Taiwan-Chinese relationship politically, the history of people just trying to get the microphones in the government to speak, um, what, the DPP, DDP, DPP, um, Democratic People's Party, you know, the, 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 good, the good guys, the people in party are. And 
and they and that they and how the new Taipei was different. This Taipei and how this this city was more like Chicago. This city was more like Houston. Or and and but you know that's campaign, but just it is by it was by far with mode number two, the geopolitically most complex strategy to try to figure out because there were real circumstances because China controls the economy of Taiwan that comes down to let's have tourists. All right, let's have, let's, 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 run, let's send our people there. And the Taiwanese were, were in a bind. They are in a bind. I'm not Taiwan, but at that time it was Taiwanese. But you know, they, they had to deal with this big country that really wants them, that doesn't see them as a country and how they can run a legitimate political campaign that's not gonna be stolen or corrupted to the, make sure the KMT wins like they sort of always do. And we just happen to be there for a good moment of political chaos, political shift, kind of like the Obama time, I guess, in the US, but I didn't make anything to do with that, um, of from, you know, we're tired of this KMT thing, let's give these pe new people a chance. And so we helped set some strategy for that. That was the last one I did. Me and my That's fascinating. And there, there's so much more I think we could talk about there that, you know, both Ukraine and Taiwan are-, are Half a Diet Coke left, you know, so. They're, they're, they're countries that, you know, are w wanting to be absorbed by neighboring countries. And I mean, was it difficult for you to uh, make this transition when you're advising different political campaigns, even here? I mean, I think you mentioned uh, maybe working in the States too. I mean, you're going through radically different cultures from no. Ukraine to Taiwan. Well, that's the wrong way. I worked in Africa a lot and uh, Eastern, Central Europe, places that were not, places that didn't necessarily have a more sophisticated Political assist campaign system that required consultants and uh, social media and other techniques and tools, and you know, I would. I, and the first thing they would always say was, "We are Nigeria. We're different." And I would say, "Absolutely. I guarantee you. I know nothing besides what I've read on Wikipedia or whatever how the Nigerian political system works and the thirty-four whatever regions and." tribes and you know, tribalism huge religion huge geography which makes geography huge oil huge I, I no clue you do educate me us on the those processes make sure we don't make mistakes on understanding what is right or wrong. right down to the types of tran, tran, um, translating words that in, in english that may not translate well to a particular language you know they they would roll their eyes and say oh in our language that means you know spork you know and like i don't know that you know, but you, you don't know that so you'd be an ignorant american i don't want to be really stupid in my words but you needed to understand their culture as best you can and the best way to do that because you're not them is to ask as many people as possible and make the mistakes and, oh you can't do that and you know there there are some bad actors I and mean, there are people who are stealing elections and you're trying to avoid that. There is danger in some of these, these people to run for their parties. And you, and you try to be on the side of the angels saying, you're the right person to help run your country. And I'm gonna be with you. And, you know, maybe to US election standards, and we're doing you know, foreign corrupt practices and all this, we're following the rules, but we're trying to, where the money comes from. But maybe US standards, you may not be an angel, but for your standards, there's good you're gonna get. And we're gonna support you because you're, on the side of the angels for uh, for your country, you know, you're trying to do the right thing, and it's just and it's, sometimes it's chaos. It's chaos. Chaos sometimes is good. Do you, do you ever worry about your own physical security when you're working on campaigns couple, like this? We had a couple. We had some security teams with us in places. We had one of we had, on one of our first elections. Uh, somebody shot at the our media facility. Who were our, our consultants inside the country it was a media facility, and uh, we had we we did, but. It, some, but you know, you, you try, this, I try to stay out of the press. You don't want people knowing you're there. When you're in Africa, I'm not trying to be specific, but when you're in Africa and they invite you to go to the big rally, you don't go because you're going to stick out. You know, you're going to be the American consultant in a big rally of people. <clears throat> you don't want to do that. You don't want to be in the paper. That's the worst thing you can possibly have. And you, you end up in the paper because you know that they're the government is monitoring your communication. So you're using Dropbox as much as you can other places. And occasionally they get it wrong. And I ended up in the newspaper, the wrong name and my background. And 
you know, I think they called me Ellis Henry, Harry, Harry Goldberg worked on the Obama campaign because they were trying to, they were getting, people were leaking, all right? We're doing, by the way, we want to know what they're doing too. This is Apple research. So, but they had the government on their side. Some, many of our people will not communicate, those people will not communicate on email. And even Skype was, was worrisome at times. It was Dropbox and the like, WhatsApp perhaps, because they're in fear of, you know, what they might, might happen to them, or at least giving away sources or methods or money or donors. And, and this is your, your private consultancy that you run now, right? That's what I did uh, after for about 10 years, and that kind of wound down. I was tired of traveling, and the brand was no longer good. And so I pretty much, I wrote, and now I teach, uh, so I, I teach mass communication, social media, multimedia, at some community colleges here at University of Iowa. I teach, uh, I took my ring off, University of Iowa. I teach uh, international political campaigning for a week, special course. And I teach uh, intelligence and political risk for another special week long course for usually third or fourth year student. I'm on the political science board there. So that's occupies my time. So I've done government, Actually, before government, I worked as a, I was a market research person at a media market research company. So I did market research, I did government work, I did private sector work, I did consultancy as a political, in political campaigning, I did consultancy in crisis management and the like, and now I teach. Retired. So I kind of, I don't know what's left. Cowboy? I don't know. I'm, I haven't done military. <laughs> I don't know what exactly occupation I got left. That's that. Uh, uh, I have done government, so I guess that concludes military, but I'm not sure what I got left here. And Joe's book, again, uh, Secret Wars and Espionage Story, that you can go find right now. What is the, the second book you said it's been like professionally edited? You're really just looking to place it, uh, to place yeah. it with a publisher? Let's call it, I, I, I called this, it was actually going to be a corporate intelligence book. Actually, Kevin Maurer, who wrote No Easy Day, mm -hmm. know him. And uh, I was I had breakfast with him one time. I was talking about writing the sequel to Secret Wars, which takes place back in 86 and actually was in, got a finalist in some historical fiction categories for some awards. Um, but one of the comments I got from agents was, no one wants to read historical fiction. I mean, well, contemporary Brad Thor and Mark Graney and Josh Hood and J.T. Patton and all the contemporary thriller writers, um, and mine's historical, which I kind of have a thing for historical fiction because I'm a history guy. But so Kevin said, don't write a historical thing. Don't write a sequel. I was telling my Motorola story, says, I want to read that story. Like you wrote that and I had him sign No Easy Day. Tell the corporate story. So I tried to tell the corporate story and I wrote it and it's boring. It's just, there's just nothing really exciting. Even Joseph Finder and Paranoia couldn't make it interesting and they tried to make a movie out of it. I mean, it's, it's just not, you know, oh, look, I, I wrote a report. And look, I did my cash box. Yeah, you didn't assassinate any terrorists. Didn't kill anybody. There's no yeah. buttons, there's no blooding from this or spilling. The, so you have to bring in the agency stuff. So I created this agency element based upon some of my experience, background, and fiction. And so now it's more of a, I would say it's more of a Mission Impossible kind of book with a corporate element than it is a corporate element of a Mission Impossible kind of element of fiction. Yeah, well, like, what if you got the okay to go ahead and, you know, steal the documents? Yeah, well, that would have been a different story. I, I, that would have been a... Actually, there's probably a sequel to, to Secret Wars because the main character, or, or to, to Spy Devils, which is book two, because it could start with that. You got you got the documents and, and all hell breaks loose, which is kind of a little bit of, of uh, the current book and actually the sequel I'm working on. But there's, pick a story, you know, as crazy story. In fact, this was Wind of Change. Somebody said, as crazy a story that you can think of, it's happened. <laughs> some crazy person in some vault in the basement of the agency, you say, hey, I want to know about Greek communist front groups in the 1950s. And you go, oh, go talk to Ben. And you walk in and Ben will go, oh, okay. And he's got the, and he's pasty because that's his thing. There's these people who are patriots and they know about it and they, hopefully they're long-term and they, they're the, the knowledge. And that's kind of the people. And, I want and, and I'm one of those weird guys that wants to read that stuff too. Yeah. Well, please do. Please buy Stika Wars should, should have been written better. It's a good story. It's a good story, but technically, I needed to go back and make some changes writing-wise. But I, it's 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 as close to. I always felt it was as close as I could get without going to prison. Just, <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, um, 
I'm going to ask Joe to stick with us uh, for a few moments to do the bonus segment because I want to ask him about the 2020 campaign and where he sees it since he's a campaign guy and this is his area of expertise. He's going to have some real insight, I think, on it. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to let you guys know um, I will keep you up to date on you know Dave's status and you know we'll we'll get we'll get word from Dave as soon as possible. Um, and I'm going to go check up on him tomorrow. Um, as far as uh, tonight's show, thank you everyone who came by and watched this live. We had like 60, 65 people watching live and you know, many more of you will watch it throughout the week or listen to it. We're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, obviously YouTube, um, all those places you go looking for podcasts. Um, and you know, please like and share this video, give us a little thumbs up or a comment or a thumbs down if you think we suck, whatever the case is. Um, there's a link also in the description down to our Patreon page if you're interested in watching the bonus segments we do. And if uh, um, you wanna support the stream, if you like this stuff and you wanna keep it coming. We have guests scheduled all the way out to December, right, as of now. Um, so we're very excited about that. Joe, thank you so much for making time for uh, this on a Friday night. Um, Maybe I need us, help, let me know, that's my motto. Let, letting us steal away uh, some time from your family. And uh, oh, and lastly, there's also the link down in the description to the GoFundMe site for uh, Dave to help out with Dave's medical bills. So um, if you guys uh, can do anything there uh, to help a Dave out, um, it, it mean, it, I really appreciate it. And, uh, and for Dave, I mean, it, it's, it, there's, no, there's no thank you for that. There's nothing we can really say to thank you guys for it. Um, but I will, I'll say it anyway, thank you. <laughs> we, we really appreciate you guys. Um, uh, Joe, any, any final thoughts uh, before signing off here? Um, I, do, I go back to my, to my sort of maxims of my life. Everything is biased, so pay attention to it. Uh, everything is personal. Everything, that you do, everything we do is connected. So what I did is connected to the people today. What I did then is connected to the people before me. So if you're, if you're doing something and you think it's important, it's connected to something before you can be connected to something after. Um, and nothing was sort of made for us. So uh, the, the, the current techniques that are being used for communicating messaging are new techniques that are being used by the current people. And it's up to us as human beings to ask where did it come from, who said it, when did they say it, and, um, and to push, maybe critical, to push back. Don't just forward because the headline right. confirms your bias. All right, that's the number one disaster of our democracy. I'm gonna scroll through my Google search till I find the search that is the, has a headline that agrees with me. Ah, so it must be true, all right? Be critical, be insatiable, be curious. That's the only way we can defeat misinformation, wedge thinking, stuff like that. And when, when you see something that really activates you on an emotional level, I think that's, that should be the trigger when you, you sit, sit back and like, whoa, what, what is this? Well, and so I think the last, when I saw the story, people believe, well, we didn't talk about echo chambers and bubbles and micro bubbles. We're all in our bubble. We're all in our Shit, echo chamber. Right. I'll ask you about that in a minute. So, you know, if, if you're going to, if you're going to get these messages, statistically, you believe things are sent to people who you know, and you're not even going to read it. Right? You're just going to say, ah, I got this from Jack. It must be true. Boom. I'm just going to forward it and share it because he's inside my bubble and my chamber. Well, it may be totally false. And now you're part of the chain that lazily, inadvertently, human naturally forward something on that's just going to perpetuate this, this continual bubble of people living inside their own lives and not having a chance to think outside, to be insatiable, be curious, just things that confirm their bias. And that's what the Russians are doing to us. They are just square on. <laughs> and, have, and God bless them. I don't well, know if that's the way to put it, but you know, it's impressive that they know what the best things to push. We, we know we're pushing on them. I hope our guys are pushing hard and doing the right thing, but they're gonna do, they're gonna, they're gonna use um, the tried and true techniques. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna be fraudulent. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna bring up, a, they're, gonna, they're gonna put things geographically like our own campaigns are gonna do. They're gonna mimic and mirror sites and create memes that we, that unless you're really curious, you didn't check that URL or who it came from exactly, or just do a little bit of Google searching or whatever searching you want to use. If you don't like Google, use somebody else, use DuckDuckGo or whatever and find, you know, is that true or not? Take, it's the 30 seconds thing. They're gonna do it. They are doing it. I mean, that's what they said today. 
you know, in the, in the, in the current information. They're gonna, they're gonna pit Black Lives Matter versus the police. They're gonna pit, uh, they're gonna go across the spectrum. That's what they're, that they are doing it. Because we're human beings and, and we have our biases based upon how the algorithms are allowing us to collect information because that creates our bubbles. It's the, Netflix, since you looked at this, Netflix thinks you should like that. Well, that's your bubble, all right? That's, you're inside it. It's the, I'm a hunt for new shoes and suddenly the new shoes have to show up on your, on your social media feed, all right? That's, you're inside it. And then, you, then it starts echoing around. We talked about this before. I'm not, you get a, probably a lot more military guys on your thing than I do. And inside the military bubble that you're winging around, there's army rangers over here, bubble, micro bubble. And there's, there's Navy SEALs over here. And then there's uh, policy people there. The micro bubbles inside, but it's even more complex. I mean, uh, and the only way out of it, the only way out of it is for the humans to say, I, are you sure about that? Let me spend a few seconds. Let me, I don't, do I, it's, and that doesn't mean don't believe believable things. Not everything is made as a conspiracy. Not every poll is biased simply because it's against you before. Some things are really what they are. They're in the middle, they say things, they do. Not everything is partisan. And that is the problem. I found that part of the research study that came out on the uh, Night Ritter thing that I promised, it was what they're impacting us by our partisanship. They see that. We're allowed, and we're allowed to be partisan. It's part of our democ democratic freedoms. We should support the policies, the programs, the, whatever we are. If a political party identifies with that, fine. If not, you go, you, 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 you do what you want to do. That's, that's freedom. But they are able to go after our partisan nature with information that's going to exacerbate the problems on one side or the other. And we allow it. Shame on us. Well said, Joe. I mean, yeah, I uh, I can't emphasize that enough. Like I said earlier on, the personal responsibility aspect of it, rather than just taking what's put in front of us at face value, um, means yep. so much. And when you add on to it, the fact that we're overwhelmed, you know, it's, it's it's not a it's a cliche, but you know there is a we're getting stuff at the speed of internet. It's a, just a, the, it, we're getting it not just a lot of it, we're getting it quickly, and. We are, we are trained to just move quickly, right? It's that three seconds, I need it right now. So we, you might not even bring up the fact that this might be misinformation. This might be a bot. You know, use bottle, bottle meter or hoaxy or some uh, tool that's free that you can actually say, oh, this, I'm gonna run this articles, these sets of articles, and it'll tell you, it's really impressive. If it's a bot, if it's a human, if it's, if it's a whatever, based upon the parameters they had decided, you know, friends or retweets or things like that. But there's, there are things you can do and it takes a little bit of time. Most people are inclined to do it. So it's up to those who may be a little bit more attuned to tell people, and I tell my classes, you're now the most media literate people in the school, go out and tell somebody about this and make them and, and, and perpetuate it. Because if not, it's, you know, we're just- Yeah, no, they, they need to, they need to, this class you're teaching at college students needs to be taught to high school students all across the country. And it's funny because when I bring up, I'm gonna talk about fake news. Um, they're like, oh, we had that in college. So I go, well, did you, what about this? What about that? And they're like, oh, well, we, we don't have that. So they think that they, that you actually think the less enlightened ones are, are, are protected, that they are looking at it, but they're not, they're not. And, and, and neither am I in some cases, I've made mistakes. And it's just because it takes effort. And so actually they, the school, Asked me to put together a class at COD, College of DuPage, on fake news. I don't even want to use the word fake news, but it's a good brand. It's hot. So it's called like fake news, the search for truth in the modern world. I thought that was have a dicey, dicey class name, trying to get people. I don't even know what I'm going to teach yet. Okay? I'm a, you know, I haven't created the class yet. I still have a few weeks. If people sign up, they get enough enrollment. But I want to try to, to, to hit deep fakes. I want to try to hit technologies. I want to try to hit misuse of data and graphics. You know, oh, this graph says that. Well, really, well, the, the axes are wrong and the, and the things are slight. You know, you just, you're just looking at things and you're moving. That means, how, I don't just get that mean because it has that phrase underneath that says it brought to you by the Bureau of really cool news and facts. Well, who, the, who are they? Have you right, checked? Right, right. Uh, but this meme confirms my bias. 
So it must be true. And it's got a name. It looks really cool. And I'm, I'm not going to look them up. I'm just going to forward it on. Maybe and then that's human nature. And I and I can't train. I can't change them. I try to teach people to be aware of it. I try to espouse it now because it's frustrating to me. When I, I scan lots of news, I, I'm I'm a multiple news person because I try to um, keep my bubble big. I have biases. I mean, I you know, I have I watch more than some more than others. But I'm always checking the others. I want to know how they're saying the message. I want to I want to read uh, or look at well done things from the other sides of my biases. Maybe I'll change my point of view, or maybe see what they're doing that might be wrong or whatever. It's on both sides, it's a war. Um, but not every not, not everybody does, that and they don't have to. But just maybe a little bit, a little bit of curiosity. Facts aren't scary, man. Facts are. Facts are uh, in you know, my old John Adams line. You no know, facts are stubborn things. All right. Now it's my facts are better than your facts. You know, you know? Tr truth is sort of truth. Although eyewitness testimony supposed to be true. The best testimony. Oh, they, they were, they, they were doing this. Oh no, they were doing that. But you were in the exact same place, a different frame of reference. So your eyewitness testimony is your perspective from your spot. And theirs is from their spot. And they both may be true, but they're true through your filter of where you were and your biases. Hands up, not hands up, this, that, whatever. You know, and then it's we need to see the body camera footage. Well, that, you know, that's a different perspective too. All right. And and that's why, not necessarily for body cam footage, but the deep fake of creating fake videos and no one can tell is incredibly dangerous because you can't tell. Um, and it, you really gotta, you really gotta pay attention to them. Uh, so there's so this world of what is really true. Here's a photograph in in, in the court. Well, is it is it is it true? Is it, has it been manipulated? How can you even tell? Right. So that's that's a problem nowadays. I I, I tell the story. I don't know if it's true or not. That because I read it from some historian, I'm a history American history guy. That no one really knows what happened at Gettysburg, the most covered battle of the Civil War, because there wasn't any drone watching right. the thing. Everybody had their own little piece of the battle. And they were interviewing these guys right afterwards. What happened to you, 20th Maine? And you know, Chamberlain said his thing, and, there's, and the Confederates said their thing, but that's their piece of the battle in the smoke in the chaos of war. You know more about war. You know, you know it than I don't know nothing. But it's your truth, it's your eyewitness, and that's being transported to the digital social media world. My truth, my vision, my perspective. It must be right. And how do you defend against that? How do you counter that? How do you have a conversation about that? That takes effort. Well, Joe, on that note, I'm gonna uh, yeah. I want to roll right into the uh, into the other segment to talk about campaign 2020 because I know you have some interesting thoughts on where that's going. Yeah. Um, so everyone who joined us tonight, thank you again, and uh, we'll see you next week. Oh, and I should tease out who the guest is next week. I, I try to remember to do that. Uh, Hopefully, something more interesting, younger, more handsome, and not quite so overweight. Uh, he's a, he's a handsome devil, Francis Villanueva. He uh, has written a book about the Filipino special operations units, and he uh, he spoke to a lot of the same people that I spoke to when I was over there in 2017. So, and I'm halfway through reading the book too, so I can tell you his his sourcing is good. Did a really good job on it. Um, so we're going to be talking to him about the Filipino Light Reaction Regiment next week. Um, and, you know, they, they were also trained by uh, American Special Forces and participated in some very, very interesting operations that you've probably never heard of. So that'll be next week. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And uh, I'll see you then. Thank you, Joe. All right. We're all done.